I know I'm going to hit a chair and fall down, so I'm going <laughs> to move up. So I'll fall this way now. So We've been in a series called Kingdom People. Been enjoying it? About 12. <laughs> well, I'll catch up a little bit. Uh, we opened up with Pastor Mike and the Beatitudes, and we walked through that chain. Blessed are those, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who show mercy, blessed are the weak, blessed are the, you know the whole line. I could read it all to you if I wanted. That was a chain. Jesus was, this is the first message Jesus is preaching coming out of the wilderness. And he shows them this, this chain of salvation, walking through this, the mournful spirit, knowing that you're spiritually poor, that only Jesus is the only way that you can have riches spiritually, salvation spiritually. Jesus is the only, the only way. Then Brian talked about salt and light, that the Beatitudes was the process, and salt and light is what we become. It's the, it's the result of walking through that process from the Beatitudes. You're salt and light to this world, and we don't want to get diluted by the world, and we don't want our light to be put under a basket. We want to shine through that. These things are all connected. Then we talked again about the root of obedience as Jesus walked through, hit some of the, the, the tenets of the law, but went to the root of the heart, and that our hearts are changed, and so our actions and attitudes should be the same. We won't do the things that we were doing if, at the root, our heart has truly been changed. We talked about whether we were truly believers or just make-believers. And then last week, Sarah came and brought it. Throw off, she called it. We talked about just acting differently, being differently. She told a story about her car accident where she was expecting someone to come out in rage, but the person came out and prayed for her. And then someone else came and joined the prayer. Because that person acted different. Everybody saw something different. Well, this is just a continuation of all of that. Because this is part of the same message that Jesus is sharing. And I want to share with you some context to where Jesus is going before we enter into it. And that's Matthew 6, 1. This is the first verse that we're going into. But think about all of those other messages that Jesus talked about all of those things that I just discussed. And now this verse is going to put a context on where he's going next. Matthew 6.1 says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. We'll talk a little bit more about that context. Let's pray. Father, you are awesome. And we invite your spirit here to move in and through each of us through the power of your word. That this message given 2,000 years ago in a different language, in a different land, in a different culture, has every bit of the application today as it had then. Because the words came from Christ the Messiah. And they pierced the heart, changed the attitude. We thank you for your spirit being present in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So sometimes we, we kind of look at things and we, we get the wrong message, we get the wrong answer because we're looking at things from the wrong perspective. See, one day Stacy and I were walking down in St. Augustine 
on one of our date nights. And we do this weekly. Thursday nights is date night. Sometimes some of you have joined us on date night. And we have a good time. We do like to go down to St. Augustine, walk around. And we're walking down to St. Augustine. I got my shirt on and I'm, I'm looking at my shirt and I'm saying, I think the dryer shrunk this shirt. <laughs> and she said, I think it was the refrigerator. <laughs> you see how we looked at the same thing <laughs> and drew a different conclusion. We do that with this portion of scripture a lot. And, and that's why I bring that story up because it, it, it just kind of shows how the human condition, the, our human nature tends to lean in a certain direction. And just as we talked about over these weeks, and particularly Sarah last week, kingdom people need to look at things differently. Kingdom people have to put on a different set of glasses. And so, as we read through this, we're going to try to get a different lens. Because there's three things Jesus is talking about in this portion of Scripture. It's when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. The first thing I want to tell you right away, as a follower of Christ, if you're a kingdom person, that these three things, he doesn't say, if you give, if you pray, and if you fast. He says, when. Jesus is expecting that this is a normal part of a Christ follower's lifestyle and culture. These three things should be woven into our lives. They're not just something that the holy people do. They're something that Every Christ follower should mold their life through these three things. Giving, praying, and fasting. And Jesus goes in and talks about these things. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off with the giving part of it. When you give, there's a real connectivity here. As we set this context the warning here in that first verse in Matthew 6, 1, is about your motives. It's a warning about motives for righteousness. Now, we come to church and we hear great messages like Pastor Mike gave and Pastor Brian gave and Sarah gave. We hear these great messages and we have these motives to change. But unfortunately, the motives fall into this trap. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. We're looking for the pat on the back, the attaboy, the atta girl. We're looking for the accolade. We're looking for the praise. We're looking for someone to see us, another person to see us as holy or righteous. We're looking for their approval. And that's a problem. Because if that's what we're looking for, and you get it, that's the end. This is a warning about motives for righteousness, and it tells us about waiting for a reward from your Father. And this is the context of this entire section. It's not about the people necessarily. It's not about what they think about what you do. It's about what God thinks about what you do. It's about his response to how you act, how you've changed, how you adjust, how you interact with people. It's his view of your relationships. It's his view of your responses. It's all about what God sees in us through all of these things that we've already talked about. And now he talks about these three specific things. He says, starting at verse 2, Thus, we know it's connected because of that word, thus, 
When you give, when you give, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do, in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, will reward you. This, this is really very cut and dry. It's, it's really not a difficult passage to parse through. We sound our trumpet. People who give sometimes say, well, I gave X amount to this, and I gave X amount to that, or I gave to this person, or I gave to that person in need. This is exactly what he's saying. If you want to do that, then when someone says, that's great, then that's it. That's the reward. That a person or people have said, you're so generous. And they're right. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're expecting more, if you're expecting God to respond in that, he's saying, he's, you've received your reward. That's the end of it. So when we give, whether it's here at Life Coast, whether it's to a missions trip, whether it's to somebody on the street corner, whether it's somebody in need, a friend, a family member, a stranger, doesn't matter where the giving is, we're supposed to be generous. He's calling us to be generous, but he's calling us also to keep that between you and him. He says there are rewards. That reward is an interesting word. So I kind of looked at that. It's, it's, uh, it does mean generally what it, what it translates as. A reward, a, 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 a gift, a, a blessing. It does mean that. But it's, it's often used in agriculture when people are growing fruit. And they have to put the effort in to get the reward, which is the harvest, which is the fruit and how much fruit and how ripe the fruit is and how, how delicious the fruit is. So that reward is kind of that extra blessing, that sustenance, that, that gift of, of more than you, you put the effort in and you get this amazing blessing. Any of you who are gardeners may understand that. You have to get out there and you get in the weeds. Nobody's out there going, nice job weeding out there. Did good job pulling up them there weeds. Nice job with the fertilizer. You put that on just right. That was very nice. Those flowers look good. That orange tree's blooming. Looks great. Nobody's out there cheering for you, are they? But when the flowers bloom, and when the fruit ripens, you feel rewarded, don't you? And that's what God's saying. I have so much more for you in the place of rewards. You have no idea what I want to give you. But if you just want the accolades of people, then you have your reward. You've got what you were expecting. That's the whole context of this entire portion. And so now we're going to go into praying. And this changes the whole outlook of how we've looked at this. We call this the Lord's Prayer. But this is really Christ saying, this is how you pray. This is really the Christian's prayer. Jesus giving us an example of that. And so we're going we're gonna to walk through that portion here. And we're going to break it down a little bit because this is an amazing passage of Scripture. And too many people say it rotely without any meaning. And he actually addresses that within this portion of Scripture all on its own. And when you pray, this is 
Verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Keep bringing up those hypocrites. This is a common thread in here, multiple times. And the hypocrite is somebody who does one thing and says another thing, or believes one thing and does another thing. So when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. There's that same thread. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. It's an interesting word as well. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And we'll get to the Lord's Prayer in just a minute. But these first portions of Scripture, it says, don't be out saying all the big flashy words. Long prayers, elegant phrases. That's a hard thing for a preacher to read. Because I want when we have corporate prayer, that's a good thing. We want to do it well, but I don't want to pray for you. I want to pray for you, but not for you. Does that make sense? I want to pray to God for you and for him. I don't want my prayer to be seen as that I did it so you would hear me say good words. I want the Lord to hear the prayer. One time I, I, I said something to somebody, a uh, friend of mine, good friend of mine, um, who, who uh, often prayed uh, using these and thous. Thouest father, we praise thee. And, and, and this is how we prayed. We're, we're really good friends. And so I said, why do you pray in the King James all the time? King James English. And he goes, well, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and my nose was bleeding. <laughs> and he was right. He was right. He wasn't talking to me. And that's how we should view prayer every time we pray. I'm not talking to you. You're not talking to me. You are in communication with the holy God who created you and all things. That's what prayer is. And that's how we should approach it. That's who you're talking to. So when he says, you know, go to your room and shut the door. Do it in a secret place. By yourself. Off alone. Because do not heap empty phrases. Because more words don't mean more herds. God doesn't hear it more just because you piled more words on. God wants to interact with you in prayer. This is what I love about Rooted, which is coming up again in the fall. This is what I love about Rooted in our prayer experience. Because in our prayer experiences, we go off on our own. And so many people who have experienced this through the rooted groups have experienced it before in their entire Christian walk. To be off alone, to engage with the creator of the world, and listen for what he has to speak into your heart. Why do you get off alone? Get rid of the distractions. Get rid of everything that's getting in your way. 
Is corporate prayer a good thing? Yes, it is. It's a, it's a great thing. But always remember, every prayer is a conversation with a holy God. So when you pray, just remember that. And then he shows us how to pray. He comes to this five-point structure of how to pray. He's not telling them, use these specific words. When you pray, say these things all the time. That's not what Jesus is saying. He says, when you pray, pray like this, in this fashion, with this model. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Some of you are debtors, some of you are trespassers, but that's the prayer. It has, it has five points to it. I'm going to hit those five points and talk a little bit about each section. The first one is praise. The first one is praise. Our Father who art in, he art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. We need to praise God. It needs to be the first thing out of our mouth. Praising a holy God. Honoring and blessing him back just for who he is. He's a holy God. He's the creator, the sustainer of all things. We should be praising God with the first utterance of every prayer. This is the structure. This is what he's telling us. The very next thing we should go to, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The first part is praise. The second part is purposes. Purposes. Your purpose. The kingdom purpose. We're talking about kingdom people here. There's a kingdom purpose. God's purposes are moving forward. But he has purpose for your life too within his kingdom purposes. So we praise God. And then we say, God, what is my purpose today? What do you have for me today? What do you want? How do you want me to interact and act with my family, with my friends, with my coworkers, with everyone who comes in my sphere? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I want to be part of what's going on in heaven and make it part of what's going on here on earth. That's the purposes. That's how we should be praying. And too often, the very first thing, hello, Jesus, uh, I need this, I need that, I need that, I need this, I need that, amen. No praise, no purpose, just what's in it for me. That's not what Jesus has called us to. That's not the conversation Jesus wants to have with us and the Father. He's our intercessor. He's our intercessor. We're praying with the Holy Spirit within us. If you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have the Spirit interceding with your spirit, with Christ at the right hand of the Father, and you're praying to the Father through this triune God, this relational creator that wants to have a relationship with you, an intimate, powerful relationship and we are just giving words. I got to tell you, this hit me all week long. So it's, you know, it's time for you to get it too. <laughs> too many go through the motions prayer, mail it in prayers. If you just remember the very first part, you're praising the creator who made all things, including you. If you start there, there's nowhere else to go but these other places. Start there every time. Start with that. Your purposes will come right into line. You'll say, why am I here? What do you have for me, God? I want to join your kingdom purposes. 
today and every day. The next one, give us this day our daily bread is provision. So we have praise, purposes, provision. I got all these words. I'm feeling very David Jeremiah-ish here. But, <clears throat> but provision. He wants to take care of us. Give us this day our daily bread. We know other places in Scripture say that he'll take care of our every need. So you wonder why he puts this in there. That's kind of a need. It's your provisions every day. Bread is symbolic of both spiritual and physical provision. So he wants to give us provision, provide for us all the things we need, both spiritually and physically. It's that, that bread, that sustenance, that manna that is so amazing that God provides. And he wants you to know that he provides, so he wants you to be talking about that in your conversations with him. Whatever the real needs are, he's going to come to you when you come to him. The next one is, really, this is where everyone jumps the shark on this one. They, they get off the tracks, they, they go down another train, somebody hits the switch rail, and they go flying off the context into a whole different context than what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, this whole time, as he, as he started off with, uh, Jesus is the master. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. My brain is flying here. Jesus is the master of talking to those who are under the law, which is where he is right now contextually, and talking to those who, are, who would be under grace when he fulfills his calling and his mission at the cross. This, this folds in. Both the Beatitudes folded in to those who were living under the law and those who would call on his name for salvation that folded in. And this does exactly the same thing. It folds this in. And people who are living under the law, people believing they're saved by legalism, people that believe that they're saved by doing good would be cut to the quick with this phrase. But those of us who know and love Jesus as Lord and Savior, need to look at this in a whole different way. Because the context, he lays out the context. He tells us what it's about. It's about who are you looking for for a response? Are you looking to people or are you looking to God? And that's what this is talking about. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hmm. That doesn't sound very gracy. It sounds like God saying, Jesus is saying, if you forgive other people, then I'll forgive you. But I want to tell you that this is still in the context of a believer. This is about penitence. So we have praise, purpose, Provision and penitence. And I know that's an, it's an old-fashioned word, but it's about humility. It's about humbling yourself. This is an act of righteousness. When somebody does you wrong, you forgive them. There's nothing, there's nothing in this world that paints the picture of the gospel than when somebody does you wrong. And you just forgive them. It is the gospel in your actions, in your life. You are, when you tell someone, I forgive you, you have just shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. They just got a picture of what Jesus did for us. While you, I, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And your sins were forgiven on the cross. The gospel is forgiveness despite the harm done, despite the sin, despite the offense, despite 
whatever was said or done. Forgive them anyway. Forgive them. This is such a gospel message, and here's why. This is not about salvation. This verse, this scripture, this phrase is not about salvation. It's not about your eternal forgiveness. It is about your relationship with God, your walking relationship, living relationship, daily relationship with God. If you are unwilling to forgive others, then Jesus is going to treat you exactly how you treat others. In Matthew 18, there's a parable. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but the basic gist of it is, man owed a debt to a rich man. The rich man forgave his whole debt. It was 20 years of uh, annual salary. Forgave his whole debt. This guy walks out, goes and finds the people who owe him, and say, pay your debt back. And when they can't, he puts them in jail. And the master comes back and calls him an evil servant. Still a servant, but just not walking with God. If we want God, our relationship to be intimate and blessed and rewarded, then when we are holding offense against somebody else without forgiving them, then God says that hampers the relationship, that thwarts the relationship, that blocks the rewards. There's things that happen. We grieve and quench the Holy Spirit in our life. The Holy Spirit that is in you because you're saved is quenched. The power is crushed down. When you're holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness, then God is not going to keep moving forward with you. He'll walk with you. He'll be there. He's waiting for you to return. But if you expect that he's going to bless unforgiveness when he has forgiven you all of your sins, and he's saying, go and do likewise. Go share the gospel in every part of your life that is forgiveness you want to change a world you want to change a culture you recognize when somebody offends you and forgive them and let them know you've forgiven them you you know what's the great thing about forgiving someone when they know they've done you wrong and you forgive them and you see them out in the store you know you can genuinely go say hi to them and smile and give them a hug and they want to hide You don't, you don't carry the bitterness. You're not going to go hide because you've forgiven them. You don't have any problem with them. You forgive them. Just forgive them. This old saying, many of you have heard it, carrying bitterness and unforgiveness is like having something against someone and drinking poison hoping they die. It's, you're letting them live rent-free in your head. There's all kinds of sayings about this. God wants you to be free. And he wants to move and work in your life and bless you and reward you. And if you do not forgive the debts of others, then he's going to hold back his blessing to you. And because he's going to treat you exactly how you're treating them. You're holding back blessings from that person by not forgiving them. And I know some of you are sitting there, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they treated me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. How How did we all treat Jesus? How did humanity treat Jesus? They nailed him to a cross. He was rejected among men. And he forgave us. And he's saying, you want to share the gospel? You want to truly share the gospel? Forgive. He goes on to say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We know that in James 1.13 it says that uh, God doesn't tempt, nor can he be tempted. So why are we asking him not to lead us into temptation? Really a conundrum. But it's very similar to a, a, a Psalm 141.4 verse that says... Um, 
Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that it, I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. It's, and so he's saying, it's, it's less of a don't lead me, it's more of a don't allow me to get caught up in this. Because quite frankly, there's lots of evil things that are very tempting to do. Call them delicacies there in the Old Testament. Delicacies. They, they, they draw us. They draw our desires. But he's saying, lead us not into that. He's saying, Lord, help us not to get drawn into those, those kinds of activities, those kinds of people, the people that are trying to pull me away from my relationship with you. Help me to be drawn to your people and to your relationship with you Help that intimacy happen. None of this, this is not about salvation. This is about rewards from your Father. This is about blessings from your Father. This is about intimacy with the Father. This is about surrender to the Father. This is all about your changed heart. This is all about the same thing we've been talking about. Kingdom people are different. They're different. The last, the only part that he repeats, he adds to out of that prayer is the very next part of the scripture. For if you forgive others their trespasses, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's the only part of that prayer he reiterates in a different way. How important is that forgiveness? That's the most important thing. We're carrying the weight again and again and again. We keep holding on to it. It keeps drawing us away from the intimacy with God. Forgiveness, the Old Testament bitterness, rots your bones is what the Old Testament says. Science is just catching up with what God told us. It is a physical, medical fact that as you hold on to bitterness, your body releases toxins into your body, into itself. So indeed, yes, bitterness rots the bones. It eats you up from the inside out. But forgiveness is the gospel. Forgiveness is the gospel. When you call someone who's just done you wrong, or you send them a note, you send them a letter, send them an email, and you say, I, I know you did this and it hurt me, but I forgive you. And I hope that our relationship can be restored. Wow. They may not receive that forgiveness. That's not what you're called to do. That's their issue, not your issue. You want your relationship with the Father to be right. This is what is called. When you fast, the last part, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. There they are again. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, the context just continues through the entire portion. God wants to bless his children, but he wants you to be doing things to please him directly, not others. And I know the first question, I've gotten this before, what about our 21 days of prayer and fasting? We're doing, that. We're doing that in front of everybody. We're doing it as a family, as a body, as, as one. We don't show the whole community that we do it. We do it here as one before the Father. That we're united as a family, Life Coast family. 
We do this together. We don't go trumpeting it out to everybody on the street. We do this here. This is in-house, in-family. We do, we do honor this passage in how we do this and why we do this. We do this before the Father. We do this to get closer to Him. We do this to draw, to put, set aside the things that distract that we might become closer to Him. That's exactly what this is. But what it's telling us not to do is to walk around and put a poster basically on your face and on your body that you're fasting for God. You're so righteous. I'm sorry, I'm fasting for Jesus. <laughs> They're saying, don't walk around like this pitiful person, like, you know, you're so holy, you're sacrificing. You should be just as joyous on day 21 of your fast, or day 40, or however long you fast, you should be just as joyous as you were on day zero when you were bulking up for the fast. I don't know if any of you bulk up for the fast, but I bulk up for the fast. I eat right till midnight. I don't know if that's holy at all. I don't think it is. But do not look gloomy but anoint and wash your face. Secret fasting equals rewards from your father. Did you see the, the thread that kept going if you're taking notes? The thread is there, rewards from your father. He wants to bless you. That's what kind of a father he is. You dads out there, how many of you want your kids to do well so you can you can say, nice job, good stuff. I love it when you do good. How many of you dads want to do that? Why do you think our Heavenly Father is any different? He desires for us. He's showing us how to do things, how to walk in His righteousness. And He says, I want, I want to bless you. I want to reward you. I want to do it so badly. But you want to go to the other people and, and hang with them. And and let them pat you on the back. And he goes, okay, you, you get your reward. You'll, that's your reward. You got it. But kingdom people, kingdom people should humbly desire kingdom rewards. Not human rewards. Kingdom rewards. God wants to bless you. He wants to come into your life. He wants you to feel his presence. He wants the power of the Holy Spirit to move in you and through you. He wants you to be able to share the gospel. He wants you to have good things. This isn't health and wealth. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about earthly riches. I'm talking about godly blessings. Could they involve money? Absolutely. But that's not what we focus on. We focus on the intimacy and the amazing relationship with our Father. That's what kingdom people do. That's who kingdom people are. And we're never going to change a community if we keep looking for the community to give us an attaboy. They're only going to see a difference when we're not looking for their applause. They're only going to see the difference when we're doing things only for the Father. Because when they see that, they say, they really believe what they're saying. They really are convinced. That person really believes in Jesus. There's something to that. I need to look into that. I watched and I watched and I watched and you kept giving praise to Jesus. You kept going back to Jesus. You kept doing it over and over again. There's got to be something to it. I see your life. It's not perfect, but you always have joy. There's got to be something to it. That joy wells up when you are getting rewards from the Father. That's when the joy wells up. You can't help it. When you know God's blessing you, you can't help it. You can't help but have joy. But what are we going to do? I'm going to ask you to stand up. Here's what I know. I 
I know there might be some in this room that are holding some bitter feelings towards others. Someone who just did you wrong. Someone treated you nasty. Spoke ugly things about you. Cheated you. Abused you. Hurt you. Hear me please when I tell you. I am not saying what they did was okay. And neither is the father. But what he is saying and what I want to express with my whole heart. If you want to return to joy and blessing from the Father, you need to forgive them without any expectation that they're going to respond. Because that's what Jesus did for us. He so loved the world, the Father gave his only Son, that whoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. He forgave, knowing that many would not respond. And he's asking us to do the same thing. So as the worship team brings us before the throne of Jesus in this quiet moment. I'm going to ask you to come down here. There's sticky notes out here. If you want to write the offense that you're going to forgive and put it on the cross, say, Jesus, I forgive them. Just write it on there and stick it on. We'll have people down here to pray for you if you desire prayer, prayer teams, pastors, elders. Boy, I want you to move on. I want you to get into that intimate relationship with the Father and surrender. Don't let the bitterness rot your bones. Father God, I pray for this room, and I know, I know that I know, the Spirit is saying, you need to forgive be the gospel. Live it out with your whole heart and forgive those who have done wrong against you. Forgive them. And your Father who is in heaven will reward you. Jesus' holy name. Amen. Come bring your bitterness down. Lay it on the cross.